afternoon, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you to our Sunday Worship in the Word. Really excited about what the, what God has to say to us today. That's to you and to me. Certainly glad that you're here. Listen, don't forget to share. I, again, I just believe that sharing, getting these videos out, uh, you know, I'm, this is not about me trying to get monetized or anything like that. This is really about the gospel, trying to get the gospel out, using this platform and using this forum on the Internet to do what God has called us to do, to go to the uttermost parts of the world, to reach the world with the good news, reach the world with the gospel, not pictures of me, not, you know, pictures of me eating food, not pictures of me, you know, with a new suit on, new car, really getting a good picture of who Jesus is and what he has promised to do in our lives right now if we receive him. So listen, let's take a look at the word. I'm going to be coming today out of the book of Acts, chapter number 19. I'm just going to read just, just three verses. That's Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read this for you in your hearing. Hi, Mom. All right, so let's take a look at it. It says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Put your finger right there, some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? Paul asked them, and, and they said, the baptism of John. That's what they said. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just bless you, and we thank you once again for allowing us to be here. We know that it is not an accident, but that you, by your divine presence, providence, and power, have gathered us together once again, that we will be able to get instruction from you, directly from heaven, straight off the presses. So, God, we just thank you right now for the rapt attention that you're going to give us, that our ears are open to hear. Our hearts are open and inclined to receive all that you have for us. We bless you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, there is a, um, you know, one of the interesting things about this scripture is that the scripture deals with several different things. You know, we look at the Acts of the Apostles. Oftentimes we can look at this as a catalog of the, of the actions of the apostles, right? That's where Acts comes from. It's the actions of the apostles. And oftentimes we'll look and we'll see a chronicle of what they did. So in lots of ways, many people look at the book of Acts and we get kind of a chronology of, you know, what's happening, a chronology of the birth and the growth of the first century church. You know, we get a somewhat of a chronological knowledge of Peter's interaction with Paul and, you know, where they went and, the, you know, the James and, and Jude. And so we get a lot of those things. You know, as we begin to look at, you know, what the Acts is all about. But again, I think we'll miss it if we if we view it that way. We'll miss the gospel if we understand the gospel as a chronicle of the life of Christ. You know, as a chronicle of his days upon the earth. That's all that it is. Just just a, 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 a meshing of information together to kind of let us know, here's what Jesus did, when, where, and how, right? But the reality is that, that when we look at the Acts of the Apostles, we're getting a lot more than just what they did. We're getting an understanding of the role uh, and, 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 the, and the power and the authority given to apostles. We're getting an idea of what an apostle is supposed to do. When we look at the Acts of the Apostles, we're getting instruction and, and apostles are getting instruction concerning their role. Pastors and leaders are getting instructions concerning their role. When we look at the Gospels, we're not just getting a, a chronology of Jesus' life, but we're also getting instruction on what a pastor is supposed to look like, what an evangelist is supposed to look like, what witnessing is supposed to look like, and who the Messiah is, and what the Messiah does, and the promises of the Messiah. We get all of those things. So there's a lot here as we look at the book of Acts. We get a chance to look at what the apostle does, why there's a need for the apostle, and why there's a need for apostles today. Now, when you look at this particular uh, area of scripture, one of the things you find out is that there's a question here about the Holy Spirit. There's a question here about the ba about baptism, about what it means to really be a believer. And what you'll find here is that there are a variety of different teachings and practices that we find in the early church, in that early church community. You know, we look at the early church, you know, we oftentimes harken back, as we do with anything in the past, you know, back in the day when, you know, grandmom and them were going to, I mean, it was perfect. They, you know, they knew who the Holy Ghost was. They, they understood the power of the Holy Ghost. Back in the day, you know, I mean, a thousand years ago, see, they understood God and they operated in power. We need that power now. We needed to get back to where it was. But when you begin to really look at the Acts of the Apostles, when you look at what you see here, it's probably, you know, something we need to avoid 
thinking that we somehow understand, well, they, the church, the first church understood this. So they understood that they believe this and believe that when you look at the scripture, when you look at the Corinthians, when you look at Thessalonians, when you look at Galatians, when you look at what we're looking at today in the book of Acts, we'll find out that we had this false idea that the early church had some uniform doctrine, that they had some uniform, one way of thinking, one way of practicing. But we find out that they had different ideas about baptism. They had different ideas about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that you'll find out is that these things have been debated for centuries. The things that we think are newfangled arguments, you know, newfangled questions, we need to get back to where they were in Paul's days. We just believe God. Well, you'll find out here that that struggle is a human struggle. It's not a struggle. You know, it's not a matter of whether the Holy Spirit was poured out then in a way that he's not pouring out now. No, the Holy Spirit is still pouring out truth. And the reality is that even in the church, there's still a need for the apostles. There's still a need for the fivefold ministries that we're not unified. We've not come together under the banner of unity and truth that is in Jesus Christ. There's still a need for what the apostle does, which is an establishment, you know, office. That's a, that's exactly what the apostle does. When you What you find out here is that no matter what the terrain, the apostles are really like, you know, a, a company that goes out to establish foundations, right? And when we talk about establishing foundation, we're not talking about just laying out a, a cement slab and then placing a house on that cement slab. No, no, we're talking about understanding the terrain, understanding the, the geology, right? Understanding what it's like to build a house in a swamp, building a house, you know, in sand, building a house, you know, on, on watery terrain, whatever it is, the apostle's office is an establishment office, meaning that the base, the foundation, the core of what this house is going to be, the sturdiness of this house and the, 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 the ability and potential to ward off wind and rain and all those things that will corrode a house. The apostle's job is to establish the house, is to establish the church on a firm foundation of truth. That's exactly what the apostle's job is to do. So when we look at here, the Lord is actually showing us more than just Paul being beaten, more than just the places that he traveled, more than just the miracles that, that he did. But the truth of the matter is we're getting an understanding of his job. If anybody, if there, if there are apostles out there today, they need to really understand what God is actually showing us, that there is still a need for establishment and reestablishment in the church today, that there are places where, you know, people still believe some things that are not quite there, that they have a form of godliness, but not the power that is in the, in, in, in the truth of the gospel. So in, in this time here, there was no particular, uh, you know, people held different interpretation. They had different practices. And so when you begin to look at this, this is one of the reasons for the fivefold ministries. When you look at Ephesians chapter, uh, you know, Ephesians chapter number five, or Ephesians six, uh, and as, as well as Ephesians chapter five, one of the things you'll find out when we look at the inception of the fivefold ministry, it's meant to teach the Bible truth and to lead the church to the unity of Christ, which means that the church is not unified. Listen, we're not there if the sky has not cracked. We're not there if God is still raising up apostles. If you're going to any ordinations anytime soon, I've got, I'm, I'm a part of an apostles ordination in May. Uh, you know, th there's still a need for apostles today. You know, there are many people who look and say, well, God doesn't do that now. You know, he established a church with Paul. And, and, and guess what? This church was already established in Ephesus, yet Paul has to come back and do a reestablishing work. So the scripture here shows us that there was a variety of teaching that was going on there, a variety of practices that were that were there in the early church. And so while Apollos is at Corinth, the Bible says that that that, that it happened while he was at Corinth that Paul went to this this inland country to Ephesus. Now, you know, Paul now comes to Ephesus for an extended stay. He had wanted to come here some years before this, but remember the scripture had already said that the, the, the Holy Spirit had forbid him to go into Asia. The Holy Spirit had not allowed him to, to, to minister in Asia. But now Paul is now back in Ephesus. You know, he's on his way back uh, to, to Corinth on his second missionary journey. On the first journey, he brought Aquila and Priscilla with him. And, and so these were people who were also ministers and he left them in Ephesus. And that's exactly where they also met this man by the name of Apollos, who is a Jewish teacher. Apollos is a devoted Jew, a, a great man of God, a great Jewish speaker. But Paul, Apollos had an issue. He only knew about the baptism of John. He knew about the baptism of, of repentance. He had whatever information he knew about Jesus 
he had only gotten through that understanding of John and what he had heard from John. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but he knew nothing about the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when Paul comes back to uh, Ephesus, like he had promised that he was, the Bible says he found some disciples there. Now, these disciples that he meets are also followers of John. They, they also understand the doctrine of baptism. And they so they were probably there doing Apollos' earlier ministry there, learning from him. But Paul comes and he asks this interesting question. He says, uh, did you receive the Holy Ghost? Uh, the, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And, and they said, no, we have not even so much as heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, you know, when Paul goes in here, we, we don't we just look at the scripture and try to extrapolate some things from the text. I don't recall this being some habit of Paul as he goes into different places asking them if they had received the Holy Spirit. I don't remember this being some way that, you know, and, and that we can track through the New Testament that, well, this is kind of regular. This is how Paul normally operates. When he comes into a place, you know, kind of like a, a fraternity where, you know, you give a secret handshake. Somebody says, hey, you know, like I, I met a, a frat brother of mine the other day, you know, where I was at, uh, I was preaching at a church in New Jersey and I happened to see his tag. And, um, and he had, he had Phi Beta Sigma in there. And uh, so I went back in the church and uh, and I said, that's your, you, I said, you're a frat. And he was like, yeah, yeah. He said, and we start talking about when he pledged, when I pledged, you know, what school I went to, what school he went to. And then, you know, I'm almost, you know, I'm 50, I'll be 58 in May. He reached out and he gave me, and he kind of covered his hand in the way we do. And he gave me the handshake, right? And I, he gave me what is called a challenge, right? He challenged me. And then my job is to respond by another handshake that, that comes with that. He gives me the challenge. And then the job of another fraternity brother is to respond to the challenge. And so even at this stage in my life, he gives me this challenge, right? And, I, and my job is to respond to it. Well, you know, when you begin to look at this, Paul is now coming and there's something here that he says, Hey, you're frat, right? These guys are supposed to be believers, but there's something about them that's not there. You know, I mean, maybe it's been a long time. You know, I haven't been, you know, around a lot of fraternity activities in, man, you know, 30 years. You know, I've seen fraternity brothers from time to time, but I haven't been to a step show, hadn't been to any meetings or anything like that. And so the reality is that he may have given me a pass and said, if I had not returned the challenge, you may have looked and said, oh, man, it's been a minute. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a preacher. He just preached here just a moment ago. Bro probably is, you know, he's probably a sigma. But, you know, the reality is he challenged me anyway. Paul now comes and he sees something here and that he can't just leave. You know, he looks at these brothers. They they give him the sign. You know, they, they show him the, the, the right side. But Paul is looking and saying, wait a minute, something is wrong here. And he comes to them. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Now, we don't know what it is that prompted this question, but something had to be there. It may have been a lack of gifts that he was watching as he was coming to the Ephesian church and he was just watching them and looking at the operation. He may have seen a lack of gifts there, that there, there were no operations of the Holy Spirit in that church, right? Now, I want you to get this. This is a functioning church without the Holy Ghost. This is a functioning church without the power of the Holy Ghost. This is a functioning church ministering Jesus without really knowing who Jesus is. So Paul is seeing something that's lacking. It's not what's there, right? It's not the almsgiving. It's not, you know, the, the, the music that may be there. It may not be, it's not the friendliness that's there. Paul doesn't mention that these people just didn't give a big hug and a wet kiss when he walked in. But Paul is seeing something lacking in their spiritual completeness. You know, we don't have an indication, you know, that this was just the way that Paul does, but he sees something that prompts him to ask this question. Now, he's right on point because he asked them and they respond. They said, no, 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 we haven't even so much as heard that there's a Holy Spirit right now. So we, and, and now what we understand something here, these are Jews. They, they knew about the Holy Spirit. Apollos being there, you know, they, they would have known Achilla and Priscilla being there. They would have understood about the Holy Ghost, right? They knew the Holy Spirit was real. They understood that. They're not saying that, you know, we don't know who the Holy Spirit is. We, we've, so, we've not even heard about the Holy Spirit. No, but what they did not know was the promises of the Holy Spirit. The, these Ephesian disciples, they didn't know about the nature of God. It was not the, the Spirit of God and the nature of God, the promises of God, the way of God were not revealed to them. There was a deficiency 
in their baptism. They, uh, we, they said, we didn't even know that when we, when we got baptized that we were, going to, we were supposed to receive the Holy Ghost. We were never taught about the principles that, that came with the idea of the Holy Spirit coming and living in our lives. When we got baptized, we never even expected, we never thought that there would be something else other than this water. We never expected that there would be something else other than these rules and regulations. We never had in our minds that there was something other that, that was outside of the moment that of what we did, right? We gave our lives over. We decided to do right. We decided to turn from sin. We decided to, to do the right thing. We decided to be pillars in our community. These are all things that they knew about, that, that we, we heard about that. We know what good people are supposed to look like. We know what a good man is supposed to be. But Paul is looking and saying, you didn't know that you don't, you don't have the whole package. He, they didn't see they, they said, we didn't even know that the presence of the Holy Ghost would be a presence in our lives upon receiving baptism. We had no idea that the Holy Ghost would live in us. We never expected him to transform us. We didn't even know anything about that. Listen, they had received a spirit of baptism, but they had not received the spirit with baptism. And I want you to get that. They, they, they didn't know that the spirit of God was a gift that was promised upon their belief. Paul said, when you believed, did you get, did, did you receive the Holy Ghost? Because I'm watching you and there's an emptiness here. I'm watching you and there's a lack of light here. I, I'm, I'm checking out, you know, what you're cooking and I don't, I don't taste any salt in here. And since you're supposed to be the salt of the earth, yeah, there's some seasoning that, that that's missing here. They, 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 they knew a little bit about Jesus, but they didn't know all that Jesus really did for us, especially in the promise of the Holy Ghost. Now, you know, when you look at this, and, and again, just so we make sure that this is not about checking out the people of Ephesus. This is not just a, a, a lesson, you know, in what, what happened 2,000 years ago in this ancient city. No, this is right now. This is in the church. This was, you know, this is the first church. And you got people who are in the church who have no knowledge of the promises of God, have no knowledge of the power of God, who are not operating under divine Jesus authority. And yet they're in the church operating every single day. You listen, the question you've got to ask yourself is that if Paul came right now and he was walking, you know, where you are, would he see? The Holy Spirit in you. You know, I mean, it, it, what does the Holy Ghost look like in your life? Are people, would people be able to see it? Listen, let me tell you something. It wasn't a matter of what Paul could see. It was a matter of what Paul didn't see. Paul was not looking and saying, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You need to start doing this. You need to start doing that. Paul was, was, was literally... Uh, uh, taken aback by the absence of something. Listen, when you walk into a place, if I got a, you know, if I got a glow on me and I got a halo around my head and every believer has a glow on them and a halo around their head and you come in and you meet somebody who puts dinner on the table for you and it's, you know, you're a guest in their house and it's great and they give you the best room in the house and, you know, they give you their room and that, that is awesome. And the children are nice and mannerable, you know, that, that's awesome. But you would still be shook and stuck and looking at them and they'd be like, well, what's going on? And you'd be looking and saying, I mean, I'm just, I'm just watching you because I'm, I'm expecting the light on you to turn on at some point. Because listen, all this good stuff you're doing is cool, right? But I'm, I'm looking for the glow because I've got a halo. And then my man over here who came in me, he's got a halo. He's a believer. And then when we went up to that church over there, all of them had halos. I'm just wondering where your halo is. I'm wondering where your light is. I'm looking at what is missing. There is power in your niceness, but is it, is it Holy Ghost power? There, there, there's something in your sweetness. There's a wonder in your smile, but there's something missing. Are you living under the influence of the Spirit? That, that's what Paul was actually saying. I'm watching you guys, and, and I'm seeing something that's not there. I'm watching human power. Listen, you can be in a church, and you can see human power. You can see human charisma. And you know what, what the old folks were talking about? You know, all that, but no power. And listen, we looked at that. We kind of thought that was an ancient thing. You know, the old ladies talking about it, ain't no power in that. And you know, you see people with crazy charisma. You see people, you know, dancing and shouting. And, and you know, you see you see these old mothers and they just shaking their head. It's like, ain't no power. Ain't no power. And you know, we kind of shut it off and throw it off like, it, you know, that's, it. that's just old folk stuff. You know, that's just, they just don't want to change with the time. But just like when Paul walked in, Paul would have walked into churches then like we walk into churches right now. We see up 
wars in the church. We see people going crazy over to the left and, and they're just going crazy to the right. Wigs being thrown off. Folks, they don't care about their hair. They don't care about their dress. I, 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 you know, Jesus is moving. Preachers just, you know, I can barely get to the word and the power is so heavy on me. And you know what? You'll see some people walk in and their head is cocked and everybody else is going crazy. But they're, they're looking and saying, I'm, I'm not seeing something here. I'm not seeing transformation power. I'm seeing a good show. Right. But I'm not seeing power that will change you from darkness to light. I'm seeing good cinema. I'm seeing good theater. I'm seeing theatrics that are worthy of Broadway, but I'm not seeing anything worthy of absolute life changing, eternal transformation from people. Where is the light coming from? Listen, God wants us to go deeper. I want you to understand something. Wherever you are, you are not meant to stay there. There's a depth. There's a there's a furtherance. And these people were at a spot where they thought this was it. This was all that there was. There was no place to go deeper. There was no reason to go deeper. So when you begin to look at this, these people didn't even know about the, the power of God. They didn't even know about the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. They, they, they did not have him. Listen, I want you to get this. They didn't know it. They didn't have him. Listen, you're not going to have Jesus and not know him. You're not going to have the Holy Spirit. And not know. Do I have the Holy Ghost? Pastor, come and tell me, do I have the Holy Ghost? Listen, if I tased you, I can promise you right now, you would not have to come and say, did you just tase me? Listen, if you touch a socket with something wet on your hand and you were electrocuted, I can promise you right now, when you came to, you would not come and say, did something just shock me? No, Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. If you know him, if you have Christ in your spirit, in your heart, there's no question, you're going to know. And Paul looked and said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what I'm not seeing. Listen, when you begin to look at what the spirit is speaking to us today, it's, it's not about what we have. It's about what we don't have. We're looking at churches and we're looking and saying, yeah, they've got all these members. Yes, they've got the Family Life Center. Yes, they've got great parking over here. Yes, they've got great programs for the children. Oh, man, they've got a great singles ministry. You need to go there because if your marriage is in trouble, that's the marriage ministry to be all ministries. You need to be a part of this church. They've got the best singing in, around Christian education off the chain. And when we look at this, we miss what Christ is saying. Listen, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. You got an organization, but you don't have a church. Hey, there is no church without Christ being in it. You have an organization, but not a living, breathing organism that has the power to transform anybody. You have the power to pray, pray. You have the power to fast, right? You have the power to give, right? You can give out coats and clothes and bikes and all kinds of things. But without Jesus, you have nothing. Paul looked and said, there's a church full of people without Jesus. This actually is not Jesus' house. They aren't in his family and they don't know it. That's why apostles are so important today because there, there are people right now that need to be established. This was not, Jesus, you know, intentionally sends Paul there because he sends an apostle. He doesn't, doesn't need a pastor to shepherd them yet, right? Paul's going to do that work while he's there. They, they don't need an evangelist to go out and give them a knowledge of Jesus Christ here. No, Paul's going to give them that. They need to be established in the doctrine. Do you know what a believer actually is? Not just a member of your church. Do you know what a Christian really is? Not just a part of your denomination. Do you know how many people are walking around with the Christian banner simply because grandma went there? Listen, do you know how many people saying, well, you know, I, I mean, I believe in Jesus. And who don't know anything about him, never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, never received him in their life. But because it's in their family, because it's part of their tradition, because we all go there. I mean, I haven't been in a while, but I mean, I kind of grew up there. So, you know, I'm kind of a Christian by default. And Paul is looking and saying, wait a minute, I'm not seeing light. There's something I'm supposed to see. Hey, bro, I'm going to pull you to the side and see, I'm going to give you the challenge. Now, if you can't, you know, give me the, the, the hand signal back. Something about this shows me you're not a brother. Now, you know, because frat fraternities are out there, right? People know the colors, right? They know how to throw up signs and, you know, do all the different different signs and, you know, you're cute. They, they know which, which signs. I mean, all you got to do is just watch TV, watch a couple movies, you know, go to a step show or something like that. You'll be able to see it, right? So so you know the wording, but there's so they only you only learn the, the special handshakes after you've been, if you pledge, right? You only get that from the brothers who passed that down to you. So you, everybody can go out there and say, I remember when I was in high school, you know, I'm calling myself this, calling myself that, remembering this, but I didn't know the handshake. I didn't, I didn't know the secret things. 
that belong only to those that are brothers. There are secret things here that are, that belong to those that are that have been a part of the fire. And so Paul now comes and says, "Well, let me ask you this. Do you know, because you've been doing this for a minute. Like, do, can you believe this? I've been ministering for a minute. I've been in this for a minute and not even saved. In the church, leading the church, people patting me on the back." thinking that I'm a believer, calling me a believer. They don't even know what a believer looks like. I don't know what a believer looks like. I'm assuming that I am, and that's the danger. That's why an apostle comes in to establish, to establish the doctrine. The apostle comes in, and they don't, they don't, don't fill in all, fill in the, the electric. They don't, they don't put in the plumbing, but they put in the pipes. They, they put in the foundation. They make sure all the ports are there. Listen, when the plumber comes in, he knows exactly what conduits are there. When the electrician comes in, all the things for the electrician to tap into are already there. Here's where it's supposed to be. Here's where the bathroom's going to be. Well, I was like, no, nah, I would like it over here. No, nah, no, nah, not in this house. This is where the bathrooms are, where, where we are here. This is the best place for the living room. Here's where the electrical outlet's going to be. They're already roughed in. Now we just actually connect them. So the apostle now is looking and saying, this house is haywire. This house is not built on a, a firm foundation. The foundation is religion. The foundation is not Christ. The foundation is churchiness, but the foundation is not Jesus. Listen, there's so many people that are locked into their church, that are connected to their church, who have no connection to Jesus. you more Baptist than you are Christian. you more Pentecostal than you are Christian. you have seven-day Adventist and you're not Christian. Listen, the reality is there's so many people that are out here Pentecostal. Listen, you up under your pastor's doctrine, but not under the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. You're under the limits of somebody else. Apollos, who probably taught them, he hadn't, Apollos had to learn about the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about the Holy Ghost. So these men are limited, and they were listening to limited people. And thank God, that, that, thank God that he saw those limits and didn't throw a lightning bolt down there. Saw the limits and didn't throw a spear that would go through all of them. He saw the limits and sent an apostle their way. And listen, God is still sending apostles now to churches that are established. We've been this this way for a hundred years, brother. We, you know, I mean, we've been doing this when before you were born, and yet God is still sending apostles saying, "Great." You got 50, you know, 50 years in. Good. You've been 50 years of error. You got 175 years in. Great. 175 years of error. You ought to be thanking me right now that I won't let you go into 2023 following the era of your parents. I'm not going to let you go in, into the new, into this new year, into this new space, into this new dangerous time following the powerlessness of your denomination. So the reality is that many people are in this place right now and don't know it. That's why this message is so crucial because this is not about looking looking over there and looking over there. It's looking at yourself. It's realizing the danger that they're in. The danger is that these men were going to teach their children, this is Christian. This is Christian. Making sure that you are rigid in your rules. Making sure that you give every Sunday. Making sure that you are on this committee. Making sure that you dress this way and never knowing Jesus your whole life. Having tidbits about him, but it's not about him. It's about doing good. It's about living right. It's about no drugs. It's about no alcohol. It's about looking this way and never knowing Jesus. Changing your clothes, but never changing your heart changing your job and your friends, but never changing your mind. And that's where the church is right now. We're in a position where people are coming in, you know, because of finances, they're, they're flooding in and they're coming in and saying, I just needed a banker. I need a financial advisor. Jesus do that. Good. And so I come in and I'm learning about finances, but never learning about Jesus. I'm learning about how to be, you know, how to handle myself as a single man or, or, or how do I handle myself as a married man. But I never learned anything about Jesus. I come in and learn negotiating skills. You know, I come in and understand, listen, if I give this, God's obligated to give that. And we learn about how to manipulate Jesus that we don't even know. We learn manipulation tactics and we pray to the ether and because we don't know how to go boldly for the throne. How can you call on him whom you not believe? So the Bible is, these men are in dangerous positions in the church. This is, the apostle doesn't just go out and establish over there. He's not, the apostle's job is not just to go over there, but there's a work in the church right now that apostles have. In 2023, the great place, God is saying, finally, I'm sending you back to Ephesus. Before there was an evangelistic work that had to do, before there was an establishment of new territory, but now Paul is left 
you know, the Corinth, the, the, the uh, uh, Priscilla and Achilla, and the, and Apollos, they're, they're in Corinth. Paul is now in Ephesus, and God is saying, now, let me tell you what the apostles' role is in this new time. The apostles' role is to go through the churches that are already established, and there's going to be some tearing down, some rooting out, some planting and building. Uh, Jeremiah's role was to tear down, to root out, to plant and to build. There's some stuff that's been planted, that's deep in the church, that has nothing to do with Christ. There's some faiths and beliefs and some ideas that are faith in people, that are, that are faith in the ideas of people that have no connection to the truth of Jesus Christ. They willingly entered into the water. They said, who was, Paul said, well, then what were you baptized into? They said, we were baptized into John's baptism. That we, we, we willingly entered into the water. Man, we heard that message about getting clean and getting washed and, you know, changing. And we definitely jumped in that water and got washed up and changed. And hallelujah, I'm, I'm new, right? Then, what's happening today? How many people are getting baptized by water who are operating in John's baptism right now? My change came when I got into that pool that day. I'm still struggling now. Don't get me wrong. And listen, yeah, that's a real thing. We're going to all struggle. But here's the thing. Did, who, whose baptism were you baptized in now? Because if, if water is all it is, you got to understand that that's not enough. You are deficient. Listen, they were baptized into John's baptism. Listen, you know what the reality is? When Paul asked him the question, he says, whose disciple are you? They basically said, we're John's disciple. They, they didn't understand totally what they were saying. They repented of their sins. They, they did what John did in Jesus' pre-cross ministry. They said sorry, right? Many of them were going, they were, they were living morally. They were giving alms. They were fasting. They were praying. Yet they had never come to the knowledge of Jesus. They ne you know, ever learning, but never coming to the truth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What knowledge is that? Uh, that you got to depend on him for forgiveness of sin. You got to depend on him for everlasting life. We didn't, we didn't know about that. We looked and said, I did that wrong. I got to say, I'm sorry. Listen, you, you, t you talk bad to her. You better apologize. You know what I mean? So listen, this is just good civics class, right? This is just a good American goofus and gallant, right? This this is just straight goof. Remember, I don't know if you remember High Times in that, that magazine. Goofus does this and he's a bad boy. But gallant does this and he's a good boy. So we just learned good boy and bad boy stuff. You know, this is just like, you know, uh, you know, schoolhouse rock. You know, we learn what the bad person does, what the good person does. And yet, never knowing, they were not believers in the risen Jesus Christ. How dangerous. Uh, listen, they get the title, Paul says, and he saw some disciples. There were 12 disciples that he meets. And guess what? They're disciples of John. They're not disciples of Christ. There are people who are disciples of their elder. They're disciples of their bishop. They're disciples of their apostles. I know what my apostle said. Do you know what Jesus said, though? You know anything about what Jesus said? No, but I know a good story because uh, my bishop would always come and say, and, and, and can quote people, but cannot quote Jesus. Listen, Paul's question is about their conversion experience. Paul's question reveals to them, and their answer reveals, we don't know anything about the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to stay where we are as a people, as a society, as a church, until we understand it's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not going to take your anger at the street. It's not going to take your anger at what's going on. It's going to be the power of the Holy Ghost. The ability to love in this time is going to be so hard. Unless you have the power of the Holy Ghost, you can't do it. The, 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 the desire to go out into the street and to evangelize in this climate, among these people, in the way that they act, Listen, without the power of, of the Holy Ghost, you can't do anything but circle the wagons. One of the reasons why churches aren't going out but are having so many activities. One of the reasons why so many churches are not going out but are not trying to convert people. They like where we are. They clicked up, ganged up. You know, it's just us. You know, we second back. You might as well get you some gang signs too. Because listen, you don't care about going going out, and bringing new blood into the church. It's just about staying where we are. It's us versus them. Why? Because without the power of the Holy Ghost, you will not be compelled to move. Without the power of the Holy Ghost, you can't love the unlovable. Without the power of the Holy Ghost, you won't understand you have authority over all the authority, all the power of the enemy. You guys already given you power over his power. So when you look at the gangbanger and the thug, ain't no way you can go out there without the power of the Holy Ghost. When you look at them girls out there and the way they look at you, 
You know, ain't no way you're going to go over there and say, sis, can I pray for you? No, you better stay home. You better wait in the church. And if she comes to the church, you'll be glad to be there. You know, but they take two or three with you, even in the church, because you're so scared in the church. Why? Because there's no power. Because there's only been a baptism of repentance, but not the full gospel, not the whole role. And the church, if it's going to do what God has called it to do, and it must, and it will, God is now opening up the door and saying, eat the whole role. I know it. Methodists eat the whole role. Baptists eat the whole role. Pentecostal eat the whole role. Nobody has that whole thing. Eat the whole role. Understand your whole. It's not about being intellectual without love. It's not having love without intellect. Right. You got to know some things. Right. So there's there's a lot that goes on here that only comes with the power of the Holy Ghost. Repenting of sin is not enough. You can't being sorry for what you did is not enough. If you don't have Christ, you don't have anything. And you know what? Here's John. John knew the limitations of his ministry. John knew. John was they were baptized in John's baptism. And John knew my ministry is not designed that you should rest here. My ministry is not designed for you to stay right here. You know, listen, there are ministries that need to grasp this, that there are some, you are one step. And, you know, we, we boo-hoo over the loss of people not realizing that sometimes we're one step. John was one step. People were lamenting over the fact that they left John to go to Jesus, but that was the way it was supposed to be. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm supposed to lead you to Christ. You are not meant to be stationary. You are not meant to get comfortable here. So when John comes, he says, listen, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandal I am not worthy to even carry. And he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That was the promise. They knew nothing of this fundamental transformation of the lost, moving from darkness into light. They knew nothing about the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if people don't know about the Holy Ghost, if they have not received the Holy Ghost, they're not part of the family of Christ. And I want you to get that. That's that's essential that we understand that today. If you've not received the Holy Ghost, if people have not received the Holy Ghost, listen, I can tell you right now, they're not part of Christ's family. And that's why the apostles are so important. That's why we can't leave the work that is in the church. We, you know, I'm so sick of church folk. I'm, I'm leaving and going to South America. I'm so sick of church folk and I'm leaving. I'm going to Mexico. And we just want to abandon the work. Listen, an evangelist has a work at home too. An apostle has a work at home too. Pastors are not just looking outside, you know, of their congregation, but they have a work too. To turn away from sin is good. It's a good work. To repent of sin is a good work. But that's an alternative religion by itself if it's not salvation. Listen, repentance of sin is not salvation. And we need to get that. I'm sorry for my sin. Listen. It, 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 that's in, if you if that's alone, you just embraced another religion. That's it's really you just had a religion of debauchery, a religion that that uh, of selfishness, a religion of self, and you just left one religion and moved into another religion that has no connection to salvation. Repentance of sin will not save you. Sorrow over sin will not save you. So I want you to understand something. Regret does not save you. Crying at the altar is not enough. Being guilt-written and shame-filled, and I can barely show my face, and I didn't want to come in there because I've been doing God so wrong. Listen, great. That could be true, but that's not going to save you. And we need to grasp that like never before. Listen, what am I talking about today? I'm, I'm saying this. I'm not talking about turning away from sin today. Because listen, turning away from sin only still turns you to you. Being sad about what you did only turns you to you. Unless we turn to Jesus, unless we look unto him, who is the, both the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end of our faith, we have nothing. We have the most talented people in our churches, and we're not leading them to Christ. We're leading them to guilt. We're leading them to shame. We're not giving them solutions. We're exposing problems and we're hoping that a bigger gift is going to do it. You gave $12,000. Listen, God's blessing you. He's really, he's doing something in you. You know, Pastor, I came before the whole church and told him what I did. You know, I confessed it. Oh, Lord have mercy. God is blessing you. That's going to change you. And listen, we're so shocked that th these things are continuing. We're, we're so shocked that there's so many people saying, I keep trying and praying, but nothing's happening. God is like, because you're not letting me do it. Because you don't have me. 
You have religion. You ran to the church. You didn't run to church. Christ. Listen, I want you to understand something. We are complicit in this because we sent people to the church instead of sending people to Christ. We sent people to the pastor's office instead of sending them to Jesus. Instead, of, listen, the pastor's office is great. He, you're going to need your pastor. God said, I'm going to give you pastors. Ask my own heart who will feed you with wisdom and knowledge. Right? No doubt about it. But the role of each of us is to lead people to Christ. The goal isn't, I got to get you to come to my church this Sunday. I got to get you to meet this man. Oh, man, he's going to change your life. I got to get you to meet this woman. She's so anointed. How about meeting Jesus? How about, like, not waiting and saying, well, listen, there's some water right there. You can get baptized right now. And listen, and let me tell you something. You will receive the Holy Ghost. When, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you'll receive power. Notice that Jesus didn't leave the earth and just let the disciples go on and say, listen, it's about you. No, they had Jesus all this time. They had Jesus for all the, these years, and yet they ran when, when trouble came. They were walking with him the whole time, and yet Peter denies him three times. They, they're, they're walking with him the whole time, hearing about the resurrection. Yet when he is in the tomb, they don't run to the tomb. Mary does. They don't come and say, listen, it's been three days. He said he'd be up again. Let's go down there and see. No, none of those. Why? Because doing good works, which is what they did. Witnessing, which is what they did. They went out two by two, right? They did some miracles. All of those things doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make you a follower of Christ. It's only after the resurrection. It's only in receiving the power. And listen, you can't be a witness for me. You can't do it. You want to. But after the Holy Ghost comes, the Bible says, then you shall receive power. And then you can be a witness for me. You can't be an adequate witness for me without this power. Your life is going to show you up. Your attitude is going to show you up. You, you, the, 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 that's a veneer. Your religious veneer is going to begin to crack and people are going to see what's underneath. Listen, you know, when people get, you know, eat with their teeth, right? People get veneers. But, you know, there's some of those you know, false teeth and veneers that they, they, they you know, kind of cut your, your actual teeth down. They shave them down. So, you know, when you got veneers and, and if the veneers aren't good and you lose one of those or you lose a couple of those, you got a couple sharp vampire teeth come hanging out because underneath the veneers, are you know, it, it's what, what your real teeth look like. So the reality is that Jesus said, listen, I'm trying to give you some new teeth. I'm not, I'm not trying to do veneers on you. I'm not trying to do a cover. I'm not trying to do flappers. I'm not trying to do flippers. I'm not trying to give you an outward appearance of here's how it would look if this was real. No, I want this to be real. And listen, when you're faking it, somebody smack you hard enough, the veneers are coming out, right? If, if it's not real, if it's not really tight, it's not in there, and, you know, somebody crack you, right? And all of a sudden, dude, the dentures come down, right? If it's not real, Jesus is saying, the church is wearing spiritual dentures and all it is is just a one punch in the face from the enemy and all of a sudden, boom, the teeth are coming out because it's not real. It's not planted. It's not deep. But all of a sudden, when trouble comes and the veneers come down, I see the teeth all shaved up. It doesn't look like it looked on the outside. The inside is all messed up. Jesus said, listen, let's do away with veneers. Let's do away with these outward shows. Let's do away with all the theater. Let's get down to real change and transformation. And that starts with you. That doesn't start with you looking at the organization saying, I need a meeting with somebody. No, you need a meeting with the Lord. You need to meet with the Lord. Listen, repentance of sin is vital. But believing in Jesus is the only way to be saved. And I want you to get that today. I want to leave that with you today. That there's no other way to be saved but by faith in Jesus Christ. Not by doing right. Not by trying to act right. Not by more church attendance. All those things are good, but that's not salvation. That's going to make for a better believer if you go to church. That's going to make for a stronger believer if you connect with other believers. That's going to make for a strong believer if you're studying to show yourself approved unto God, who are, that you are a workman. But listen, you not work. You don't. You don't work here. You don't work here. Listen, you don't be crazy. Is to go into an office every day and to see a guy who's you know making copies and and. You know, going around and, you know, shoveling and stuff at the office and, you know, going out back, you know, loading up the trucks. And only to find out, like, this dude doesn't even work here. Like, when, on Friday, like, he doesn't even get a paycheck. You know why? Because he doesn't work here. When he got sick, there was no benefits. You know why? He doesn't work here. He's doing work around here, but he's not a part of the team. He doesn't work here. He's not on the payroll. So he gets nothing. So all this work is useless. This is foolish to repent. It's foolish to turn away from sin. Without power. You know why? Because you got to turn back. It's foolish to go through all these rules and regulations and not even be saved.
And at the end of the day, everybody walking out with a paycheck. Folks that didn't work as hard as you, right? Uh -uh. Folks that, that didn't even show up like you showed up. But you know why they get a paycheck? They work here. That's called grace. They work here. I, I miss Friday, but you know, I'm on salary. So no matter what happens, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my paycheck. I work here. Would it be a shame that on payday, you looking and saying, what all the work I did? Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? He said, let's depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You, you false employees. Yeah, I never knew you. You didn't work here. How many people don't work here? How many people are working in here but are not employed by the master? Listen, check yourself. And that's what I want to leave with you today. I want that to be, to resonate with you. Check yourself. Really, really, really check yourself. Because I know you know the pastor real well. I know you know first lady real well. I know you know, you know, you, your cousin is the deacon. But listen, I want you to check yourself. And that you're not following mom and daddy. And that you're truly following Christ. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you right now for your word. And your word is doing what it's promised to do. There are those who are not believers, who have heard your word today and are prompted to say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And you have given them the example that, that it's in you. That if they confess their sins, that only you are the one who's faithful and just to forgive them of those sins and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. God, we know that your spirit is cleansing right now. That you're, you're pouring down the water of the word that's washing us. And that, God, even those that have that literally did not know so much about what you were promised, didn't even know much as heard so much about the Holy Spirit, knew the Holy Spirit was alive, but not alive in them, knew the Holy Spirit was offered to someone, but didn't even know whether it was offered to them. Today is the day that they're able to receive your spirit, that they're able to pray and say, God, come into my life and just wash me, remove me, and God, live in me so that I can become a new creation today. And that even believers or people who weren't sure, today is your day of surety. Today is your day to pray that very same prayer. Lord, come into my life. Live inside of me. Guide me and strengthen me and lead me into the destiny that you have for me. Because without that, all of this is just futile. All of this is just a show. All of this is just a huge, colossal waste of time. And that some people will be benefited, but not your soul. Your soul will have no benefit whatsoever. And that would be the greatest tragedy of all time. That's the biggest trick of the enemy, to get you working and not have you be an employee of Jesus. Listen, let's get to work for Christ today. Not just for your church, not just to feel good, not just to do good things, not because you have an issue with the poor, not because you love the kids. You know, no matter what the situation is, who are you working for? I want to offer you a job today. Work for Christ and become a part of his family.